So hello everybody and welcome. Welcome to the webinar. Today we're discussing DEI trends in education. We're gonna be talking about what's happening and how are people responding? How should we respond? What are the ways that we can be responding to diversity, um, equity and inclusion efforts in schools? We're gonna be talking about K through 12, but also higher education. My name is Andrew Keg. I'm the moderator today. I am on the advisory board for FAIR, the Foundation Against Intolerance and Racism. And I am joined by three really wonderful panelists. I think you're gonna enjoy this discussion. Um, I, we have with us today, um, Rachel Seatak. She's a lawyer and she's gonna be talking about her involvement and work with the K through 12 sector. We also have Candace Jackson, also a lawyer and uh, is gonna be talking about, gosh, you know, I should have looked it up, Candace, exactly what you're gonna be talking about, but it's around this idea. We're talking about DEI and education. Um, so I'm not sure if you're doing K through 12 or higher ed, I, I apologize for that. And then Dr. Tabia Lee or Lee or Dr. Lee, as she's also known as, is going to be talking with us about higher education, DEI efforts. So everybody's gonna be talking about the part of what they do for their work, but also things that they've experienced personally um, in these different spaces. I'm going to start out by asking a general question to all of the panelists to answer this one question. And then I'm going to be asking each individual panelist a question specific to the type of work that they do and the experiences that they have. So let's just go ahead and get started. So the first question I'm going to ask the panelists is, um, what are the basic telltale signs that people can look for um, that a particular DEI effort in a particular school, whether it's K through 12 or um, university, has started to become more harmful than helpful, right? What are some of these signs that people could be looking out for? Who'd like to start? I'll kick it off. Thank, Thank thanks for hosting, Xander. Um, I, I think uh, I think a, a couple of things. I, I think um, when you're thinking about diversity, equity, and inclusion, and how to how how to tell when it is becoming harmful, what comes to my mind is uh, a couple of things. One is different treatment is different treatment, and so if you're seeing involuntary separation uh, based on characteristics, that that probably is suspicious. Um, and, and then also the the other main area that that we're seeing DEI um, become harmful, I, I think, is is in the realm of of gender identity versus sex. And and in that realm, I think one of the first signs you can tell that something is going wrong in your school is if uh, freedom of speech is being cracked down on. People are literally being told. Students and teachers and administrators are being instructed and directed and told what they can and can't say, what language they can and can't use, um, even to attempt to describe pure fact, um, and you know that certain concepts cannot be expressed without being accused of violating a DEI policy. Okay, so that's, so some of the uh, telltale signs then would be, is speech either being squashed or compelled? Yeah. Sums it right up. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you for that. Rachel or Lee, what, what do you think are some of these basic telltale signs that people can look for to determine if the DEI efforts in their schools are more harmful than helpful? Well, in terms of, you know, policy development, um, so my background is in K through 12 teaching. I taught for over a decade in East Los Angeles public middle schools as a national board certified teacher. And I've also served as a teacher trainer, teacher educator. And, you know, of course, I work in higher ed uh, now, as well as K through 12 through my consultancy. So I kind of straddle both worlds. Um, and if you're thinking in terms of, you know, policies uh, that people are implementing, there are some cues, um, signifiers within those policies, uh, either at K through 12 level and civic organizations and the corporate world where all of these DEI policies are being adopted. Um, when you're seeing things that uh, really focus in on identity um, and identity based uh, division of resources, for example, 
um, you know, topics of, of that nature, a focus on uh, outcomes and equal outcomes uh, could be another warning sign uh, and, and key phrases that you might hear um, uh, that is, you know, kind of pointing to a, a more toxic form of, uh, of, of critical um, social justice is what I call it. Um, you know, of course, there's classical social justice approaches as well. Um, but if we're looking, you know, to pinpoint, you know, if I hear or see certain phrases or words in a policy, you know, that would give me um, cause of concern or, or want to double click and just get clarification on, uh, it would be things like that, a, a focus on, um, you know, identity based uh, reality, um, a focus on power and privilege. Um, and, and how is that phrase? Um, if it's becoming the total focus of all things and, and the, the lens that we have to view the world through, that becomes problematic uh, potentially when it's uh, enacted on a mass scale uh, for organizations and people. Somewhat like the oppressor oppressed lens. Yes. I think but, I like, so. but also the power and privilege and focusing on outcomes versus opportunities. And then the, this identity-based division, right? Literally pulling people apart from each other and putting them into separate spaces. Thank you. I think that so much of this came about during COVID and many of my clients who were parents found themselves at home. They were working from home. Their kids were on their computers doing uh, distant learning. And for the first time, they were almost dropped right into the classroom. And it's, it's, it's an opportunity that parents who are working parents may not have had to be on PTA or to be in the classrooms or to be chaperones to events. And that's really when uh, my firm started seeing a lot of clients notice these issues. And as kids are back at school now, I think something to keep in mind is that a lot of times kids don't know how to verbalize in the K through 12 ages that something feels off. They, they feel like when they hear something in the classroom that um, you know, as, as Tavia has pointed out, makes them feel like if, if they're biracial, that they have a, a dad that's an oppressor and a mom that's oppressed because their dad is white and their mom is black. You know, those are the kinds of things that they are um, really feeling um, inside, and yet they are not able to express. So it's so important to have those conversations on the way home about what they learned today and how those things made them feel. And I I, I wanna pick up on that. I think that is so important, Rachel, um, also in, especially in K through 12 to recognize that ki kids are being, are being fed these concepts um, it, in a in a pipeline that is all wrapped up in uh, anti bullying and you know kindness campaigns, et cetera. So it's extra hard for especially younger children, I think, to express any kind of discomfort, no matter what their instincts say, because they're 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 told over and over again, this is the only way to look at the world and to view people and be a good person. As a social worker, what I immediately think of is paying attention to the distress that your kids are, um, and, are, and it's going to manifest really differently with young children, right? They're going to show up with headaches and stomach aches, not want to go to school. Not, you know, it's going to. They're not going to just say, "Mom, Dad." You know, they're not going to sit you down. That to look for the signs of the distress or the stress in your children. Fantastic. I also hate to say it, but this is this is part of the 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 race gender crossover and and pipeline, if you will, and that is that um, it, it's I think pretty much not really possible to change your um, oppressor status in terms of your skin color. It is, however, possible to change your oppressor status in terms of. Uh, a, a minority label designation in the LGBTQ, but particularly the TQ uh, part of that ac acronym. That because that is something that, as Lee said, is entirely self identity based. It, it, it is there is no external or uh, uh, objective um, test or or, or uh, manifestation of it. It's purely internal to identify yourself 
as transgender or queer, uh, even as opposed to uh, lesbian or gay homosexual. So that, you know, that is something also to, for parents to be aware of is that the more oppressor oppressed, uh, privilege um, discussion that, that schools foist onto kids, um, that is an outlet that I, I, I think explains part of why we're seeing more and more uh, identification rates on the, the trans and queer side of things. Absolutely. Um, I wanted to make a um, comment uh, for the audience we have disabled the chat box for chitty chat kind of back and forth. Um, the panelists can communicate via the chat box with, with the audience. We're using the Q&A. So as questions start to come to your mind, click on the Q&A button on Zoom and uh, type in your question. Some of them will be answered during our open Q&A period that will come probably in about 20 to 25 minutes. Um, and some of them will be answered by the panelists because they'll just type in an answer um, if they're looking at it during, during the, uh, when somebody else is speaking. So just want to remind people we're using the Q&A, uh, but we may communicate with you through the chat box by sending you links to articles um, and other information that the panelists are gonna be discussing throughout the remainder of this time. We have in the background um, in doing tech for us today from Fair Gavin Kuhn. So he is not on camera, but he's in the background. And so he's going to be um, uh, pasting and posting some of these things into the chat box. So you might, you might see those starting to pop up. You know, the, the first half of the title of our talk tonight is DEI Trends in Education. The second half is what's happening and how to respond. So let me ask one more question um, for all the panelists before I move into asking some more specific ones. Um, how, how, how are parents or educators, how are they seeing this happening in the schools? How are how are they supposed to respond to this? What sort of advice, guidance, whether it's personal or legal um, advice that you're giving to parents and educators who are experiencing this firsthand? What, what, what are you hearing from them? And what are, what are things that your uh, information or guidance that you're providing to them? I'm, I'm glad you asked that, Xander, because, um, you know, I'm someone who likes to focus on action and taking action. Um, and I know for many of our uh, parents and even fellow educators um, right now, they're working in spaces where asking questions is discouraged, um, is, is looked down upon. Um, and I would just encourage people, whether you're a teacher in a space or a student in a space or a parent in a space, um, to ask questions about things that, you know, um, just don't seem quite right. If you have a feeling, you know, if someone says a word, you don't quite know what they mean when they're saying it. It sounds like a word you've heard, like something like, you know, equity, for example, or diversity, you know, just double click it and ask them, you know, what, are, what do you mean by that? Um, can you define that for me? I'm just, you know, a teacher or a student or a parent, and I just like to know what you're really meaning. Um, and if you're seeing things that are questionable in, in the learning spaces, um, I would strongly suggest just reaching out to organizations like FAIR. Um, there's an anonymous report form that you can submit. Um, and I was uh, actually just reading uh, something where someone had submitted that, uh, an article about that. Um, and the FAIR folks are really amazing, um, you know, to connect with you to, to, again, help you try to uncover what is going on there. Is it something, you know, um, that's a violation of, of some sort or unhealthy or inappropriate um, uh, academically or socially or even emotionally uh, for for uh, students or teachers in an environment. Because keep in mind, what's impacting our students is also impacting teachers. Um, and unfortunately, teachers have lost a lot of our uh, professionalization uh, with a lot of the movements that have come down with these consultants uh, descending upon schools and basically telling everyone in the environment, including the teachers, this is what you need to do. This is what the research says. And then everyone's supposed to just quietly go, oh, Okay, so now I, I forget everything I've learned about developmental appropriateness and so forth and listen to this expert. So there's a lot of uh, a lack of questioning 
Um, there's a lot of um, just uh, accepting, you know, because someone comes in and they look a certain way or they're introduced as an expert, you know, everyone just kind of goes, oh, okay. And without, you know, just critically thinking about what's being said and the content of the argument or, or whatever is being um, displayed or, you know, conveyed to the learning community. So just asking those questions. And if something just doesn't feel right, fill out a form, you know, um, and say, hey, this is going on at my school. I just have questions about it. I asked this, this is what I was told and give that information and, and someone uh, will get back to you. I've, I've actually heard from people who have filled um, a, in, in the uh, reporting form with FAIR and gotten back and heard and gotten support. Uh, so that's- important. Absolutely. Um, for those of you who are listening, um, what uh, Lee is talking about is our FAIR transparency um, portal, fairtransparency.org. It is anonymous. You can type into it. You can add attachments to it. You know, if there's documents um, that you'd like to um, upload. What I want to make really clear is that FAIR is not in the business of condemning doing diversity work. As a matter of fact, FAIR Diversity is a program of FAIR, the Foundation Against Intolerance and Racism. Um, I work in FAIR Diversity as a trainer. I go into corporate settings primarily. Our FAIR and Education program um, has created an ethnic studies curriculum. We have learning lessons on a variety of diversity topics that have to do with race and ethnicity and a lot of other things. So we're not anti um, teaching about diversity in the schools. I think sometimes this, this topic gets um, shift, it gets sort of shifted into you're either for it or against it. And it's like, well, there are all these other op options. And just like you said, Lee, there's critical social justice and there's classical or classic social justice. And I know as a social worker, I'm, my foundation is the classic social justice and they're teaching critical social justice now in the schools, but it's not a for or against. This is, there are so many alternatives to, um, to do ways to do this work, not just the way that uh, people who are having difficulties with it, the parents, the educators, the students, there's a lot of other ways to be doing this. How about Rachel or, or Candice? What are some things that um, you often hear from parents, what are, what's some advice or guidance or information that you provide to parents or educators um, on how to respond to these things that are happening in their schools? Yeah, I think something that's underestimated sometimes is if a parent has the time and the ability to run for a, a place on school board, mm. um, be involved on PTA. Maybe even if they're not able to get the changes in place that they want to, a lot of times by doing that, they learn so much about the inner workings of the school and they get access, uh, easier access to things like curriculum. Whereas if I was advising a parent who doesn't have that ability to run for school board and, and isn't involved to that extent, I would say what they would want to do is to go through the process of records requests. If your state mm. has a sunshine law in place, then you are able to submit requests for public records, which includes things like curriculum. It includes things like what the teachers are being required to look at in training and to read in training, what administrators are advising teachers to look at as required or encouraged reading. Um, and from there, you're gonna wanna be looking at who are some of the big players in uh, that kind of social justice style, anti-racism view of things. And you're gonna wanna be looking for those authors and influencers in that space. You may see books by Ibram X. Kendi. This point, his name is so widespread that your school might not be using his work. They might be using someone else who's more up and coming or less known. Um, outside of the space of academia. So uh, those are some ways that they can kind of stay proactive and involved and um, even react when they see things that are troubling. Thank you for that. Let me plug another um, FAIR program. Um, well, project actually, our FAIR and Education um, program has a training, how to run for school board. So we have a FAIR and Education fellow who sits on a school board in her home um, you know, state. And um, she does these trainings where she teaches people about what a school board is, how it functions and how to run for a seat on the school board. So those are things that people can sign up for on the fairforall.org website website if they look at the fair and education um, part of our website. So thank you. That's a great, great reminder, Rachel. Get involved. Get That's involved. Fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah. 
I'll just I'll just uh, throw in that um, I've been I've been hearing a, a lot of feedback from parents that um, <laughs> teachers and principals are are actually refusing to meet one on one with with parents who want to come in and ask ask these questions and describe what they're uncomfortable with uh, hearing and seeing their their child come home with. Be persistent about asking for those one on one meetings. Uh, you create a, an email paper trail several different rounds of just politely asking for a sit down and how important it is and and them refusing if it has to go further if it has to be brought in front of the school board or if there has to be a a, a title six or a title nine complaint filed or something that that kind of record um is really helpful and if you do get that one-on-one -on -one meeting um then that is your opportunity i think to to take advantage of what lee and rachel are, are talking about and, and calmly ask those questions, point out the inconsistencies, describe, be specific, describe what your child has experienced uh, or what you have, have observed that is specifically uh, making you uh, feel like there is, um, I'm sure inadvertent uh, isolation and, and actual discrimination going on under the guise of anti-discrimination. And then I think, you know, Xander and Lee touched on it really well, but focus on the, the positive versions of what I view as a perversion of really what should be the, that classical form of uh, appreciation for all forms of diversity and equal opportunities for all. Um, so you focus on those positives and hopefully it makes it a little harder for the, the school to label you as you know, just some some bigot or somebody who's prejudiced and just hates diversity and and hates equal equal rights and and wants uh, minority groups to suffer or anything uh, of that nature. And then the last thing I would tell parents is um, uh, keep your eyes and ears open to find your allies. The school the school is is not a uniform block. There it's made up of lots and lots and lots of different people, right? And much of this DEI stuff is coming from the very top down. Um, so there will be teachers and staff, uh, counselors here and there that, that are not comfortable with it any more than you as a parent are. And, and, and so don't assume, be, be skeptical, but uh, because they, they have to enforce their policies and, and so forth, but, but don't assume that there are, are no allies within the school system that you can, you can talk with and work with. That's good. That's good to keep in mind, Candace, because otherwise people can feel, I don't know, just overwhelmed with what am I supposed to do? And if if they're reaching out to a teacher directly or an administrator directly, and they're either being ignored or denied those those opportunities to meet with them, um, and they think that they have no ally, right? There's no ally to them uh, because maybe they're afraid. Actually, maybe they're concerned, like. Maybe if I say something, what I'm concerned about to another parent, they might label me a bigot. If I, you know, so I would imagine that that stops people from, from actually reaching out. But I like that you're reminding us that don't assume, you know, at FAIR, we like to say we don't stereotype or flatten people. And it, it goes along with that. It's like, just because somebody is an educator at that school doesn't mean that they are uh, fully 100% bought in to whatever is coming down from the top. Yeah, so it's a good, it's a good reminder. All right, let me go ahead. I'm going to ask each of the panelists a, a question that's specific to the kind of work they do, the kind of experiences they're having. I'm going to start with Rachel. So Rachel, in your experience dealing with matters in the K through 12 education space, what do you feel is the most prevalent experience in the DEI space that those students are experiencing? And then also, uh, why is it troubling from a legal perspective? As a lawyer, why do you find it troubling? Yeah, so um, I think that first, uh, I'll kind of address the second question and go into the first. I think that some things to keep in mind when we're looking at this from a legal perspective is that um, what's unique about the K through 12 public school context is that we're really looking at the government that's acting in local parentis for a minor in the K through 12 context. So we've got something called a captive audience. That means that the kids have to be there in school 
they're required to be there. Um, they don't have a choice in that. In higher ed, we know that these are adults. Uh, it's a choice to be in higher education and to pursue your college degree. You can walk away. Um, and we still have in both contexts, uh, both are public institutions with state actors that are in place. So that's how we still see these issues of free speech coming in because we have these state actors. Um, that means that they're hired by the government and they're paid by your tax dollars. So uh, a lot of times the, the clients that come to me are parents who are not interested in co-parenting with the government. They want to be responsible for shaping their child's worldview and they want to be a part of their child's journey in self-expression and understanding and getting to know themselves. They don't want that impeded by those who are hired by the government and who may not have the best understanding of their child. Um, the mechanism legally for going after unfair discrimination in uh, schools that are utilizing programs with diversity, equity, or inclusion in race-related issues of employment is going to be Title VII, for education is going to be Title VI, and then sex and gender is going to be Title IX. Um, a lot of times, you know, we're we're already looking at this situation and seeing that there are many ways that um, parents want to see their kids thrive and grow and be successful. Um, but when we have programs that come in that are uh, declaring over the children that there is a certain outcome that they can expect from society because of their race, because of their color, because of their gender, um, a lot of times parents feel like they don't want their child impeded, especially at such a young age, by those kinds of ideals. Uh, we know, many of us know that there is a concept of a self-fulfilling prophecy that when it's declared over us that we won't succeed because of men, we won't succeed because of white people, we won't succeed because of able-bodied people. When our identity is reduced to those kinds of things in a way that my clients don't agree with as parents, a lot of times we see that kids are negatively affected. And I love that Xander has pointed out some of those signs of distress that may be manifesting themselves in your kiddos that you may not know what's wrong with them. Have some good conversations with them about what's happening and then do deep dives yourself as you're able to talks with your teachers and to kind of in the same vein of what Candace has pointed out, I would advise parents not to have these kinds of important conversations with teachers and, um, and administrators over the phone because it's very difficult to have that paper trail that Candace pointed out. I would advise them if they do have, or if they're forced to have, you know, that in-person or over the phone meeting and it can't be done over email to take extremely close notes. If you live in a state that has surreptitious recording law like Ohio, only one party has to know is recording. So recording is also possibly an option too. Thank you for mentioning all of that. You know, I'm. it's now dawning on me that we are specifically talking, at least in the K through 12 um, sector, we're talking about public schools, right? We're not, we're not talking about parochial or the religious schools um, or the classical education schools or the Waldorf schools or the homeschooling schools. And even in some cases, charter schools, some charter schools are part of the public system and some aren't. So just want to be really clear on that. We're talking about, as you said, the government schools. And it is, it is a requirement by law that to attend school. So this captive audience, I mean, I, I think you hit that nail right on that head um, because they, they have to be there. Now, of course, parents can elect, right, um, through lotteries through their own financial means through a lot of op, you know different options to put take their kids out of public schools but for the most part uh, my assumption is that most kids in the united states are being educated in the public school system perhaps i'm incorrect in that but i would imagine that that the majority are is that do, does anybody know if i'm if i'm wrong or right on that no, that, that's true. When it comes to DEI, though, you'll find that a lot of the secular private schools and even the parochial schools these days in, in the K through 12 system uh, have jumped on the DEI bandwagon just as much. Uh, it's for different motivations. They're not necessarily required by law to do it the same way that public schools are being told by their state and, and to some extent the federal government to do to to implement DEI. But private schools operate in the marketplace, right? And so they have jumped on that bandwagon from a, a, a profit motive, from a brand motive, if you will. So 
the the environment is it can be much the same when it comes to DEI problematic DEI. Um, the enforcement is different, and that that's where you'd want to you know talk with a lawyer because the the enforcement is just is just very different. Laws like uh, Title VI and and Title IX you know may not apply to your private school. The flip side is you may have claims for things like breach of contract and and so forth that that you can still try to hold your your school accountable for having treated you your your student unfairly or in a discriminatory way. Oh, good. Thanks for adding that, Candice. It's that's if it's helpful for uh, those those uh, individuals that are listening in or will listen in um, at a later date and time who do have children in other systems, other schooling systems. So thank you for that. Well, Candace, I'm going to ask you the next question. So comparing your time um, when you were working at the Department of Education, right, versus the landscape that we're currently experiencing as it is today, have you observed a change in attitude and legal issues that are surrounding DEI issues in schools? Um, and there's a follow-up question to that, but um, I, let me ask it just in case, but I can repeat it if you need me to. What do you feel is the most effective way for parents and teachers to ensure their children slash students learn in an environment that is free from discrimination? So what are yeah. some of the differences you've noticed over the course of time? Yeah, I, the, you know, the, I, I think Rachel touched on this, that uh, COVID may, what was a, a huge turning point in, in, um, uh, the transparency that that parents had into what actually goes on in the in their classrooms and and their students' interactions with teachers and so forth around DEI issues, um, but that also coincided with the the civil un unrest of 2020, uh, and so those two factors combined, I think, uh, in, over the last three years now. Um, we have seen a huge difference in terms of public awareness and parental awareness. I mean, this is, you know, parents becoming more and more active in their school boards and challenging their school boards than, than perhaps we've ever seen before. Um, so the, the parental awareness that these are volatile and uh, destructive uh, issues and environments, it, it, you know, for a lot of our kids, it, it, it has just skyrocketed. Uh, and that that parental awareness goes hand in hand with an uptick then in in legal action that parents more and more parents are willing they love their school they want to love their school but they are willing to challenge their school legally and so we are seeing more and more lawsuits and 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 internal complaints being filed Oh, and your follow-up, you might have to repeat your follow-up, but. Yeah, what do you feel is the most effective way for parents and teachers to ensure their, that their children will learn an environment that's free from discrimination? Yeah, well, I mean, what, first and foremost, I would, I would encourage everybody to, um, you know, just put in your own, your own time and thought as to the, just, just the very concept of discrimination, because that is one of the things that, critical theory and the way it trickles down into K through 12 has, has, in my view, really twisted. It has inverted and twisted up the, the very notion of what discrimination is, what it looks like, why it's, it's a bad thing, and, and how to go about correcting discrimination. So when you talk about wanting your kids to thrive and learn in an environment free from discrimination, you, you ha we have to start unpacking that that concept of discrimination again, because what's being called discrimination, uh, some many, much of the time to, uh, these days is not, uh, and what is being called anti-discrimination is itself discrimination. So it's a lot of word games, it's a lot of inverting of concepts and language going on out there, and so that that's the first thing is to to step back and think as a parent, what does that look like to me for my child to to be in an, in a learning environment free from discrimination? Absolutely. It's interesting. Um, just as we've been talking, you know, for the last 30 minutes or so, even we are using terms that have come from this this languaging, right, that came, you know, primarily through the, in the in the 1990s into the universities as postmodern language, we've used unpacking and problematic. 
<laughs> it's like it gets in there, doesn't it? We're we're just it's uh we're ca we're all captured to some degree or another. It seems. Oh my goodness. Thank you for that, um, Candice. Um, Dr. Lee, I'm going to ask you a question now. Um, in your experience with teaching the topics, right, the DE, uh, DEI, how does the race essentialist content or the rhetoric, um, how is it impacting students? What are some of the, what are some examples you can give us of, um, of what you've witnessed personally and how this is impacting students at the, in the higher education space? Well, I think it's impacting all of us, um, you know, not just students in higher ed or, you know, like different sectors. It's, it's impacting American society at large um, with the, you know, constant uh, obsession with race uh, and, you know, this neo definition of racism um, and how people are navigating it. Um, it's very stressful for folks um, to, you know, constantly have to be in your camp or your tribe uh, that you're assigned to or that's ascribed to you or that you willingly put yourself into. Um, it creates a lot of um, lack of understanding, um, disconnected feeling among us uh, as, as human beings, um, inability to see one another as individuals and to learn about, you know, someone's story. A lot of assumptions are made, you know, um, just when you walk in a room or present, um, you know, instantly you're checking some boxes on that oppression and privilege, you know, matrix uh, for some people, and they interact with you uh, from that lens, um, from a student perspective, you know, hearing that, um, you know, just a coddling uh, sometimes or uh, an assumption from the professor side or even other peers, you know, about who a student is or what they've been through. Um, I, I actually had a, a student that was talking to me about um, being really offended that someone was offended for them uh, because they had assumed <laughs> that, you know, that because they checked this box and, and, and this was part of their identity, you know, someone else shouldn't have said a certain thing to them in a setting. Um, and so it's like there's there's all of this walking on eggshells. Uh, we're all afraid to really just get to know one another um, and to uh, I, not just uh, we, we have we never even got to tolerance. I'm really looking for acceptance uh, of people. And so um, we're so far away from that. And, and each camp is more and more polarized. And some people aren't part of any camp. So then they're just kind of stuck in the middle. And, you know, oh, this group's going to get me if I say this. And that group will get me if I say that. And so I'll just say nothing, you know. And so and, and that's what concerns me about students and teachers and individuals in general um, so many people are, are not in any extreme, um, but the extremes are so strong um, and, and, they're, and, and the polls, that's why I'm doing it this way, because we set up American society to be very polarized, you know, even with the two party system, um, you know, you have to say you're one or the other, um, you have to check this box or that one. And, and I just think that human um, experience is so much more complex than that. And, um, you know, the heightening of these, of the polarization is getting more and more of us to like speak out and say like, hey, like that far extreme side doesn't represent me and neither does that one. Is anyone willing to talk and can we talk to each other and listen to each other and heal and move forward? Um, because what we're doing right now with trying to assert who's the most right, you know, um, is really getting us nowhere. Um, and so I hear that a lot, the frustration. Um, I think it's really important for students to be aware um, that there are many ways to approach these topics. Sometimes when you're in a setting um, and you're hearing your teachers or your professors, you know, these people who are in respected positions uh, say things and, and, and put forth a worldview, basically, um, you just start to think like, oh, that's, that's what everyone thinks, you know, because everyone in the room starts to mirror what that expert is saying. And so it's like, uh, we're just mirrors reflecting back at each other. And what are we reflecting? Sometimes it's an orthodoxy, unfortunately, um, and no one's naming it. Um, so I'm really proud of students, you know, uh, who have started digging into these topics, um, exploring what are the different approaches when someone says, this is how we do this, or there's only one way to see this, or, you know, you're either inclusive or not, they're starting to push back a little bit on that and ask more questions. 
um, and and to not be afraid. Um, a, a fear is what keeps many of us, you know, subscribing to one camp or the other, or just silent and sitting in the middle. Um, and I think that we need to break free from that. Uh, and I see students being more open-minded nowadays um, because, you know, uh, we've been fed something over the past, you know, uh, five, 10 years. Um, and some of us are realizing like, wow, it's, it's making me feel sick. Um, you know, like, and I just, I, it, something's not right, you know, um, and all my friends are saying it, but like, ah, still inside, I just have these questions. And if I ask my friends, they unfriend me, you know, like they don't even talk to me anymore. Like I'm a non-person to them. Um, it's happening with adults, children, you know, and so um, that's a toxic thing that's happening. And so I think folks are starting to, to realize that and to say like, Hey, I want to feel connected, you know, to people. I don't, that doesn't mean that I have to agree with them or be like them, or we all are going to like say, we all agree on everything. You know, that doesn't have to happen, but just so I can feel like I can ask a question and everybody's not going to like shut me down or, you know, never speak to me again, or just like assume a lot about me or who I am or what I'm trying to do. You know, um, there's this, this jump to judgment. And I think we so much need uh, just more, um, compassion and empathy and, and, and frankly, intellectual humility, um, you know, where we are able to say, like, I don't have all the answers, like, none of us do, um, you know, but we have an issue ahead of us, we're going to take an inquiry based approach to it, explore it and think of some actions that we can all agree to. That doesn't mean that we're all, you know, on the same page, and that we're all in quote, total agreement, but there's some things we can agree on and help to identify those things. So that's that's yeah. what I would say there. I, I see people looking more towards uh, wanting to dialogue, not discuss, debate uh, so much. We do so much of that. Um, it's ingrained in everything. Um, and we really have to start thinking of what things do we have in common? What are, what are our values that are shared? Um, because if we don't, it's being defined um, and we may not all like how it's being defined by one or the other extreme at the end of it all. Well, I, you know, I think you, you touched on this. Uh, I'll say it slightly differently just because, uh, you know, coming from the clinical perspective that it's a, it's a primal part of us drive to be part of something, to belong to something. And if we have worries or concerns or fears that we're going to be ostracized, that we're going to, then we're going to end up isolated and isolation is um, it's 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 deadly, right? They've done research now to find that isolation is um, harmful to our health, like smoking cigarettes, right? I mean, it's it's really really harmful. So people do want, right? We want to be able to belong. Um, I'm gonna hop over now into the Q and A. Let's see what uh, questions we have from some of the attendees. Um, the first question, some people have already been answering some, so thank you for that. The first question I see is, with June Pride Month coming up, um, how can I ensure to my children's school that I do not want them to be exposed to any lessons on gender ideology without them gaslighting me that I am anti-LGBTQ? Oof. Oof. You know, Candace, you want to take that? <laughs> yeah, I, I'll, I'll, I'll try. Um, I don't have, um, I don't have very, uh, all, all good news on this. There's a question later on too that, that um, is related about opting out. Um, it's going to be a state by state um, rule what you can opt your kids out of. Most states that have taken the most um, care to um, inject say, gender ideology into uh, school curriculum, also take care to not allow opting out of it. So be beware of that. Where you can opt out, do, because at the very least, it, it makes a statement. Um, when you are using the vehicles that, that Rachel was, was talking about, um, uh, running for school board or, or interacting with your school board or school personnel and you're expressing your concerns, you, it, it, is, it is in my view uh, very important to not cower in fear internally that you are somehow anti-gay, anti-homosexual to speak out against the concept of uh, affirming, validating, compelling the ideology and the acceptance of the ideology of uh, trans and, and queer. Um, so go in with that confidence that uh, it, it is actually 
very anti-gay um, to, um, to, to push gender ideology in schools because it, it is um, very, very clear that many, many, many uh, young people who adopt a, a trans identity um, are, are, are uh, by orientation homosexual. Um, and so it, you know, adopting a trans identity is, in my view, a, a way of actually encouraging um, young uh, gay and le gays and lesbians uh, back into a closet. Um, so be confident that expressing concerns over uh, gender ideology is actually not just uh, separate from, from anything uh, having to do with gay rights, but is actually a form of uh, promoting uh, acceptance and tolerance of, of gay and lesbian youth. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Lee, there's a couple of questions that has to do specifically with California and ethnic studies. Is that something that you've looked into? Um, <laughs> because I know that there is, there, there are, there's more than one option for ethnic studies curriculum, but the one that people are the most familiar with has, I believe has been um, uh, referred to as being anti-Semitic. Um, and I know that that's something that you've also dealt with at, at, at your um, school. And so I know I mentioned earlier that FAIR, we developed an ethnic studies curriculum because we want to compete with that other curriculum in California and any other state that mandates that. But can you say more about the ethnic studies Yes, uh, so this is something that's, um, you know, I'm not a lawyer, but it is going through our state legislature um, to make it a graduation requirement, uh, actually, to um, complete an ethnic studies course. And the models that have been presented um, thus far um, are known as critical ethnic studies or liberated ethnic studies. Um, and again, when you hear that, right, you say, oh, critical, oh, that's critical thinking, you know, um, liberated, that's freeing people. Um, but really, uh, both of those models, um, and, and at least the drafts that I've seen, um, they're actually quite toxic um, models of ethnic studies curriculum. Uh, and it's sad, it's, it's saddening uh, that in the state of California, that's being advanced as the model. Um, but there are alternatives, um, such as constructive ethnic studies. Um, when I say that they're toxic, I mean that uh, this uh, critical social justice ideology is woven throughout the curricula. Um, and, you know, so basically uh, we're going to have our, you know, younger students, high school students um, being required to take a course where, you know, they're viewing the world through the victim oppressor lens, uh, for example, um, where, you know, somebody <laughs> decides that there's a matrix of, of privilege and oppression and some groups are privileged and, so, and some groups are oppressed and they're immovable. So, um, you know, how, however you are, whatever you're assigned to is what you're assigned to. Um, and, and that's your lot in life. Uh, it, it completely spits in the face of human agency, free will, um, you know, all, all of these things that we know are so important, freedom and individuality. Um, and when I say that, I don't mean that, you know, each person for themselves and we're not interconnected. We're very interconnected. And there are ways to explore this topic uh, that don't focus on just the division um, and dismantling power and privilege structures and activism, um, you know, uh, for different um, organizations that that are being upheld, even in the curricula that's being advanced. Um, so I, I think that's something that needs to be looked at. Um, there is big problems in terms of anti-Semitism in, in that curricula. Uh, they've tried to now hide it and put it into supplemental activities, um, but uh, people are very aware of what's going on um, and very concerned about it. And uh, there are other models uh, as schools, some schools have already adopted and said like, you know, even before the law is finalized, like we're going to have an ethnic studies course. And unfortunately, they're adopting the de facto model that's out there. Um, and, and that's something that the activists uh, who have been advancing this really rapidly uh, through many sectors, they're, they're capitalizing on it. It's funny because they're anti-capitalist a lot of times, um, but they're, they're really just making, rolling in the, uh, <laughs> the, the funds there. Um, and not only that, 
but um, the minds of, of students and communities. Uh, and that's what's so dangerous and, and that we all need to keep an eye on. But there are other ways of doing it. So if you're in a school district where there are, are saying, you know, we are adopting a, a critical um, ethnic studies model or a, an, um, a liberated ethnic studies model, um, whatever the term is they're using, just ask more about it um, and, you know, ask to see samples. Um, and if you're not being provided with that, I think Rachel mentioned this earlier, this is so important, um, especially if you're at a public school, uh, there is the California Public Records Act. And everything that public school officials or any civic officials do is part of public record. And as a member of the public, you have a right to request that information um, and you know, to formalize that request. And they have a duty to respond and to provide you with that information. Mm -hmm. um, so if just talking to people doesn't work or you feel like you're shut out or you know someone doesn't wanna take the time to sit down with you, um, of course, document it well, and then use the tools that are available to you. Um, you know, Make that California Public Records Act request, um, make it detailed, it, describe exactly what you want to see and what you want to know. It is your right, it is your tax dollars, that school is your school. It doesn't belong to the ideologues uh, who are sometimes trying to hide things or not communicate about things. I don't know when that started happening. Uh, as a teacher, I've always approached things as I, I, I we're public servants. We're there to serve the public and our institutions are too. And that means all of the public. Um, so this idea of people not wanting to sit down, not wanting to dialogue, not wanting to answer a question, um, not wanting to tell you what's in their ethnic studies curriculum that they're considering or, you know, what model are they even thinking of? Uh, that's problematic. And, and it takes uh, just being assertive, knowing what your rights are um, and, and really just continuing to be persistent finding the time. I know some people work two, three jobs. They just don't have time to go sit down and look at it. Um, but, you know, there's there's ways around it. There's there's resources out there. There's even local chapters uh, with individuals, a, a fair um, who would help you out um, and, you know, lock arms with you. And, 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 and if you're timid or concerned or you feel intimidated, be able to go in with you uh, to help support you because it's, it's that important. If we don't know what's happening and if it's being obscured, then we're even in a worse place, right? We need to know what's what's happening in our schools. Absolutely. I want to let people know, even as we're we're getting closer to the top of the hour when we're going to be um, ending the webinar, if there's a question you've asked that hasn't been answered either live or through typing, because I can see that um, some individuals are typing their answers in the Q and A. Um, Gavin, our our uh, from Fair, um, who's doing tech. Um, is putting an email into the chat box for you, events at fairforall.org. You can send your question to that email, and then Gavin will send that question um, to me and the panelists, um, and we can respond to that question um, in more detail because we're, we're not going to be able to have an opportunity to answer every single question. Some of them are very, very long, and it would take me the rest of the time to read them. Um, so I want to be attentive to time. Um, let's see. Um, uh, Lee, you know, both, both you and I uh, mentioned the um, critical social justice and um, classic or classical social justice. One of the questions was asking is, is that the same as the classical or classic social justice? Is that the same as what's considered liberal social justice? And they're, they're mentioning Helen Pluckrose and, and another individual in particular, uh, Helen Pluckrose, of course, from Counterweight over in the UK, who is part of the uh, Cynical Studies um, uh, <laughs> Publishing. Um, when you say classical, are, are you meaning something similar to what they mean as liberal social justice? Um, so I would say, you know, uh, the, the concepts are definitely similar, right? That focus on uh, freedom and individuality. You know, um, uh, um, I can't speak for their perspective or how they frame it, um, but, you know, um, looking at uh, equality of opportunity instead of equality of outcomes. Uh, so there may be some similarities and overlap um, uh, there as well. Um, and, you know, and, and the point of it all is, Sometimes when something's said, um, we just think of, of the default that's being promoted and just letting people know there's other lenses, you know, some words have been captured, uh, if you will, 
And um, it's, it's unfortunate. And that's why we really need to ask people, what, what are they meaning when they say it? Like social justice, uh, it's been around for hundreds of years, the term, um, but in today's world, in America at least, uh, it, it's meaning something very specific and different than what it ever meant before. Right. Um, and so that's why I'd like to clarify what is the difference between the two? What are we really focusing on? How do we understand knowledge? Um, how do we understand each other? You know, all of those kinds of things I think are, are, are important to consider. Yeah. Thank you. Rachel, there's a question. I wonder if you have an answer for this. Um, this individual is talking about um, in private schools, especially private schools um, that are under the direction of the National Association of Independent Schools, who are now also bringing in a form of DEI that, that um, is, you know, is, is problematic. Um, and also the new transformative social emotional learning, right, which is different from the precursor, which I used to teach social emotional learning, emotional intelligence, is a fantastic skill set um, and to develop in in young in young people, but the transformative SEL changed in the summer of 2020. Um, and then the uh, as Candice has mentioned, more of the ideolo ideologies around sex and gender. So, do you have you worked with parents um, or people in the schools who are under this National Association of Independent Schools? Are there are there things that you could um, say to this person that could help them? Yeah, not so much the um, the independent association, but the SEL um, definitely. You know, the the pedagogy of SEL is not so much what the parents that um, are in my practice, their clients of my practice, are concerned with in social emotional learning. It's really that practical outcome that we're seeing in modern day SEL, and that functional way that these kinds of theories open the door to influence, and ultimately we have seen undermine some custody and parental rights. Um, so I, I love working with mama bears and papa bears that care, and if as the question, you know, when do you see the signs that a federally established DEI or SEL should be removed or, you know, that it should be opposed within your private school or your charter school, they would say that its presence is the sign that it should be removed because anywhere that equity is defined like equality, where inclusion doesn't allow for disagreement and where diversity doesn't allow that diversity of thought, our kids are at risk. Uh, the, has, the hostility that Dr. Lee mentioned, it happens in the K through 12 context too, because it's really maybe shouldn't be the job of the educators and administrators to shape and establish the worldview and those social, emotion, social emotional diversity, equity, inclusion type of ways. Uh, you know, as adults, we, we haven't yet solved big problems problems and issues of how to combat racism, how to control our emotions. And parents really don't want theoretical concepts from the academic and corporate and federal context imposed on their child's development. There's a legal concern that I'll just point out lastly, that things like social transitioning in the context of gender issues can be interpreted at worst, like a medical intervention, and at best, like the foundation for social work. Administrators and educators are licensed for neither. So we have already found ways that we are at a deficit in literacy rates and comp uh, comprehension. And many teachers, even in private schools or charter schools are overworked as it is. Many uh, administrators are overpaid as it is. So why would we support adding more to either of their plates? Yeah, absolutely. Well, we are just about out of time. I want to remind people if we did not get to your question or you have any other questions, please copy and paste that question, send it to events at fairforall.org. Gavin just put the link into the chat box. Those questions will be forwarded to the panelists um, so that you can get a response to that. Uh, so I wanna thank Candace and Lee and Rachel for being on the panel tonight. Um, I can tell from the comments in the Q&A that people really did appreciate it. And um, they have a lot, a lot of concerns and a lot of questions. And so we've just scratched the surface here. So I wanna thank you for your time and the work that you're doing. And thank you so much for sharing that with us at FAIR and our FAIR audience tonight. Thank you, Xander and FAIR. You're welcome. Thank you everybody for tuning in. Um, this will be um, made into a video, so please share it with your um, networks um, once that becomes available on YouTube. And we will see you at our next FAIR um, webinar. Thanks everybody, have a good night. <laughs>